My father was a man of few words, a stoic figure with a past shrouded in secrecy. As a CIA operative during the height of the Cold War, he was privy to the darkest corners of espionage and covert operations. Before his passing, he shared with me a spine-tingling story, one that sent chills down my spine and left me questioning the boundaries of reality. Today, I feel compelled to recount his story to share the enigma that haunted him until his dying breath. It was in the wake of a catastrophic nuclear disaster in the former Soviet Union that my father found himself on a mission of utmost importance. The CIA had sent him to investigate the disappearance of a rogue Russian scientist named Vladimir, a man who possessed critical knowledge about the incident and the potential threat it posed to global security. The gravity of the situation weighed heavily on my father's shoulders, yet he remained steadfast in his resolve. Deployed somewhere in Eastern Europe, my father maneuvered through the shadows of a world steep in uncertainty. The Iron Curtain still held its grip, and danger lurked around every corner. But it was during one fateful night while on patrol in a small town in what is now Slovakia that he encountered something that defied comprehension. As he traversed the darkened streets, a figure emerged from the depths of the night. Cloaked in an all-black coat, it stood at a towering height of ten feet, a chilling presence that sent shivers down my father's spine. Its eyes gleaming with an otherworldly intensity bore into his very soul. But what caught his attention most were the two elongated fangs that protruded from its mouth akin to those of a vampire from the stories of old. This creature, this abomination, moved with a grace that belied its grotesque nature. It discreetly hunted down its victims, leaving no trace of its existence. But on that fateful night, it found itself face to face with a CIA operative. Sensing danger, it fled into the depths of darkness, leaving my father in stunned disbelief. Driven by a mix of curiosity and duty, my father gave chase, desperate to unravel the mystery that had unfolded before his very eyes. But his efforts were in vain, for the creature vanished into the night, leaving behind only questions and a lingering sense of unease. The following day, my father resumed his mission, pressing forward in pursuit of his objectives. Yet a nagging uncertainty gnawed at the edges of his consciousness. What had he truly witnessed? Was it a figment of his imagination, a manifestation of the weariness that consumed him? Or had he stumbled upon a dark secret that lay hidden within the realm of the supernatural? In the years that followed, my father never spoke of that night to anyone but me. It became our secret. When I was around 11, I got very into fairies, but more in a witchy way, I guess you could say. I realize that's kind of old for a kid to be into things like this, but you gotta know I was a very imaginative, somewhat lonely kid. I've always loved fairies, and my mom got me a book on them. It included fairy language and a list of gifts to offer fairies should you wish to interact with them. Of course, I wanted to contact them. What little girl wouldn't? For about a month, I wandered out to my backwoods and by a river, because according to the book, fairies like to hang out around water and leave little notes written in the supposed language, along with little gifts and offerings. I'd make them little leaf baskets, leave them candy or flowers, things like that. I even recited a chant. Yeah, I know. I think part of me knew it was silly and that I'd probably never get results. But damn if I wasn't determined, so I kept on. At one point, my gifts and notes started disappearing from the bench I had left them on. I figured it was wind or birds taking it, but a small part of me hoped it was something else. A month of this nonsense, and I was getting very discouraged. I decided to leave a few more gifts for them, and this time I weighed them down with small rocks so they wouldn't blow away, and I'd know for sure. A day went by, and my gifts were still there. Another day, same thing. Then on the third day of checking, I found the gifts gone, but the rocks still there. Only the rocks were moved around. 
I don't remember how soon after that this happened, but eventually I got what I had wanted. I wandered out to the woods and saw by the river two monarch butterflies. They were very large and I wanted to see them up close. However, one landed on a branch close to the path where I was standing and I noticed this butterfly had limbs, tiny, thin, pale, limbs, hands, feet. I stopped dead in my tracks and looked hard to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. It was broad daylight and I could see very clearly. It wasn't a butterfly. It was a fairy. She had long, thin brown hair that went down past her feet in a blue dress that looked like a small scrap of fabric. But what terrified me above all else was her face. Her eyes were giant black bug, alien-like eyes. But she definitely had a face, and she definitely saw me. I didn't even try to go look at the other one because I ran. I was so scared that I bolted home and locked my door. After freaking out and keeping an eye on my backyard, the backwoods, through the window, I went back. No surprise, they were gone, and I never saw them again, despite me trying over and over again. My gifts were never taken again. I felt sad and stupid because I felt like I ruined my chance to have fairy friends, but knowing what I do now, it was probably a blessing they left me alone. What do you guys think? Has anyone else seen a fairy? And did they look like this? I just need to find someone else who has seen what I have seen. It's something I'll never, ever forget. I remember her so clearly I could draw her. Note, I went to the library and looked at every book on butterflies I could find, googled. And I couldn't find a butterfly matching any description that looked like what I saw. So I'm going to start by saying I'm basically a skeptic when it comes to the paranormal. Although I love hearing stories and listening to others' points of views when it comes to that kind of stuff, this is why I'm having such a hard time understanding what happened to me last September. My dad, grandma, grandpa, and I were attending my cousin's wedding in a small rural town just outside of South Haven my late last summer. We rented a small house in town, which was located in a very wooded area just off of a small lake. Something felt extremely off as soon as I got out of the car at our rental property. That's the best way I could describe it. Something felt off, and I was immediately uneasy. But being the skeptic that I am, I shrugged it off and chalked it up to being tired and anxious. The night we arrived, my dad and I were having a smoke outside and noticed how weird everything sounded. It was about 11 p.m., and there was no one else around. The trees were crackling incredibly loudly, and we were hearing strange animal noises, but nothing too out of the ordinary, just the type of animal noises you would hear in rural Mai, but they just sounded particularly strange to us for some reason. We said our good nights and went to bed. The next morning, my dad told me that he went outside for a smoke at about two-ish that morning and heard what sounded to him like someone close by banging on metal siding. He said it sounded like it was just next door, but didn't hear anything leading up to or preceding the loud banging, like footsteps or anything like that. We shrugged and laughed it off. The second night was when I heard the thing that I still can't stop thinking about six months later. It was about 11 p.m., Midnight and I was having my last smoke of the night. My grandparents were already asleep and my dad had just gotten into bed, but still awake watching TV. I was sitting on the stairs outside with my back to the house looking straight out into the backyard. I heard someone shout my name in a very abrupt manner, loud and fast. It sounded like they were shouting toward me from the front of the house, like they were standing on the front porch shouting for me, knowing I was at the back of the house. It sounded just like my dad, but it couldn't be him because I didn't hear the front door open or close or anything. Being a skeptic, I reminded myself to stay calm, and I quickly walked back into the house. My dad was sound asleep. There was no way that by the time I got to him, he could have gotten back into bed. I woke him up and asked him if he was outside screaming my name. He looked confused and said, of course not. I started to get really freaked out at this point. I tried to go to bed, but couldn't get that scream out of my head. I was up all night trying to figure out what happened. 
I was honestly contemplating leaving, getting a hotel room somewhere close by and returning in the morning. Miraculously, I must have fallen asleep sometime around 3 a.m. We woke up the next morning and I was so ready to get the hell out of that town. As soon as we left, the uneasy feeling I had the entire weekend disappeared. When I returned to work the next day, I told my co-worker the weird experience I had. Her face immediately dropped. She proceeded to inform me that this is quite common in the Appalachian area regarding cryptids and other types of creatures. Apparently, they try to get your attention by mimicking someone close to you, and when you look at them, they kidnap you or something along those lines. But I was in Michigan. I tried to look up information about the town I was in, but didn't find anything remotely interesting. Has anyone else had a similar experience? This happened in the American Southwest to my parents while on vacation. They stopped at a spot along their travel route to get some food and got talking to a young local who worked there. He told them about a box canyon that was on the way to their next stop. For those who don't know, a box canyon is characterized by being narrow, having high vertical walls, and a flat bottom. To hear my mom tell it, he described the canyon with an almost spiritual reverence, saying that it was incredibly beautiful and had superb acoustics, and that he loved taking his guitar out there to play. My folks like doing stuff off the beaten path, so they decided to pay a visit. The canyon seemed to be quite isolated, with no buildings of any kind around it for miles. By the time they parked their car and made it to the canyon's entrance, the sun was just starting to go down. They said they seemed to be the only ones there with no parked cars other than their own. They made their way into the canyon. After the fact, my parents have both said that they separately, without speaking of it, started to feel a touch of unease. Not totally unreasonable, as it was starting to get dark and the canyon walls pressed close on either side. Despite this feeling, they continued on, until they heard the noise. My parents report the nature of this noise differently. When I asked them to describe it, their faces sort of scrunch up, like it's an effortful task, or they're still uncertain. My dad says it sounded like a person, possibly a man, speaking a low, single word that he didn't understand. My mom says that it didn't really sound like a word of any kind to her, just a strange, deep noise that rang out from somewhere nearby above them. It was accompanied by a brief, intense flash of pale light. Neither of them knew what it was or where precisely it had come from, but they both were immediately filled with dread and an overwhelming desperation to get the hell out of the canyon. They turned around and booked it back to their car. As they exited the dark, close space of the canyon, my mom describes feeling certain there was something chasing them and thinking that once they got to their car, they would find it sabotaged. That, thankfully, was not the case, and they were able to get in and speed away down the empty road. My mom said she didn't feel safe until they'd been driving for a while, still having the panic but totally unsupported notion that they were being pursued. When they eventually spoke of it to one another, they weren't able to make any real sense out of what had happened. Neither one of them really has a theory. This is probably pretty dull as far as spooky experiences go but neither of my parents have a history of weird encounters or of telling tall tales, and so it strikes me to see them both get re-creeped out by the mere memory of this incident. Eight, I've asked my mom clarifying questions since I first recorded this story, and I forgot to update. She said that the flash of light was actually quite close to them, mere feet away, and that it sort of seemed to hang in the air for a few moments. She had a hard time describing it very clearly. When I was six, I got up in the middle of the night to get a glass of milk. Being that I was six, I went through the back door to the back porch to pee, then went back inside to get my glass of milk. Our back door had those older metal-type blinds that rattled and clanked when you opened the door every time. Our back door had the door handle lock and two deadbolts. 
I specifically remember locking all three locks that night before getting my drink because the top lock always stuck and took some off to lock it, and I was trying to be quite so I didn't wake my parents up. I opened the fridge and pulled the milk out, and when I closed the fridge, I noticed the back door wide open and something was in the doorway. I remember standing there for what seemed like hours, and it was probably only a few seconds before I ran to get my dad. When I woke him up and we went into the kitchen, the kitchen light was on. I did not turn it on and the back door was still wide open. I didn't open it. I know I closed it. I did not hear the blinds rattle when it opened. I don't know what I saw, but something was there, and I know 100% that I shut and locked that door, and short of a couple hits from a sledgehammer or a tornado, the door wasn't going to be blown and open by the wind, especially with both dead balls. That freaked me out pretty good. I can't explain it to this day, but it still makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. On another occasion, more recently, in high school, we had a school function and were allowed to take our own vehicles. So my buddies and I took my truck and headed to the function, except we had a couple bottle of Jack with us. I proceeded to get ripped throughout the night, and when it came time to leave, my friends were not going to let me drive. Well, I somehow got my keys from one of them, got in my truck, locked it, then started it through it in reverse, and when backing up, almost hit another car. I put it in drive and started out of the parking lot. When I stopped at the exit to look before getting on the road, I remember looking in my rearview mirror, and I was just able to make the shape of a man out, and I heard the words, don't do it. You won't make it two times, and then I saw my truck wrapped around a big tree on the side of the road that I was going to take home. I remember it clear as day and won't ever forget it. I put it in park and called my buddies over. They drove me home and made sure I got in all right. I can't explain that. Maybe it was the booze, maybe not. But I know for a fact that had I drove home that night, I know I would not have made it. To this day, I do not get behind the wheel if I think I might have had too much to drink. Every time I think about it, I think back to that incident, guardian angel, maybe who knows. I am not crazy, but I can't explain what I saw or what I heard on those two occasions. Ghosts, angels, spirits, I don't know, but I know I saw and heard something. There is still too much that is unexplainable in this world for me to say whether I believe in ghosts and what not not, but until it is proven... Otherwise, I will always lean to the side of believing. My parents got married in 1979 and moved to Belton. They had my older sister, and shortly after that, my mom's dad died. Several months passed, and one day they went into a Chinese food place where they were close friends with the family that owned it. As they were eating, the wife of the owner came over to their table to tell my mom that her father had come in the previous day. She noted the specific table and chair he had sat at and a vivid description of him. She said he had been asking about each one of them, including my older sister. He had been dead for five months or so. My mom was so rattled by it that she didn't even tell the lady he was dead. To this day, she doesn't really like to talk about it. Crazy stuff. When I was in elementary school, my folks decided to build a new house. The spot they chose was a spot that an old house had been standing on. My grandfather bulldozed the old house after he bought the place. Well, after my folks' house was completed, strange things started happening. I could lay awake at night and hear cabinets in the kitchen, shutting in drawers rolling in and out. Never really scared me. It just became normal. Everyone in the house could do the same thing. My great-grandmother absolutely refused to go into our house because she believed it to be haunted. Example, she told a story, and we did look it up in old newspapers to confirm it. That just across the road, a boy had been killed by shotgun accidentally going off as he crossed the fence. The boy's name was Bobby Reynolds. This happened in the 40s. My baby sister, about five years old at the time, had an imaginary friend. One day, my mother walks by her as she was sitting talking to a corner. Mom asks, who are you talking to? 
my sister's answer. My friend Bobby, no one had ever told her about me great-grandmother's story for fear it would frighten her. My mom doesn't believe in ghosts, but she does believe in angels. She believes that Bobby is my sister's guardian angel. I was working as an information technology contractor for MGM Studios during the year 2000. It was a lot of fun working there. Getting to see movie props such as the Stargate was an extra bonus. I was staying at the Georgian Hotel in Santa Monica during a major renovation. Having worked at MGM for a month, my contract was coming to an end. During my last night at the hotel, I woke up suddenly at approximately 3 a.m. Via the light from the window and the night light in the room, I could see something floating in the middle of the room. It was the head of something I'd never seen and never want to see again. It was grotesque, a man's head with snakes as hair. Its skin, which looked dark green, seemed to be moving with smaller snakes. As I watched it, it moved its lips as if it was trying to talk to me, but I couldn't hear anything. I could see the back of its head in the mirror on the wall in front of me. I really don't know how I knew to say this, but I told him it wasn't welcome and he had to leave. After seeing this a few more times, it just slowly faded away. I got up and turned on the lights in the room. Working for MGM, I thought maybe one of the guys I was working with was playing a joke on me. I checked the whole room for anything that could produce this head image, but I found nothing. Needless to say, I didn't go back to sleep. When the time came to check out later that morning, I was too embarrassed to say anything. Heading into work one last time, I did ask the guys if they knew anything about it. They all said no and promised me they would never do anything so cruel. One of them did tell me that the hotel was in fact haunted. This incident has left me wondering just what it was I saw that night. I think it might have been a demon looking for someone to possess. So my sister called my family the other day and told my parents about a strange man that she and a friend came across. They had been there for about a week and were out walking in the redwoods when a man appeared out of practically nowhere and startled them. My sister claimed that he looked completely normal and was even kind of handsome, in her opinion, but he gave off a creepy vibe pretty quickly. He apparently began asking them weird questrions like who they were and what they were doing out in his woods. After they explained that they were just out exploring, he quickly got annoyed and said they were liars. My sister and her friend began to walk away quickly as they assumed he was probably on drugs, but he walked after them and said more weird stuff. She says he even asked them to kiss each other because he knew they were lesbian lovers. They are not lesbians, by the way. My sister's friend apparently turned around and screamed at him to leave them alone. My sister said this is where he got scary as hell. She says he gave my sister and her friend the missed evil and hateful look she's ever seen in her life. And he said this in response. You two are such disrespectful bitches. I've killed a few of you over the last few years. And he'll love to add you both to my account. My sister and her friend didn't even hesitate and both booked it right after he said that. They heard him chasing after them and screaming at them. My sister says that she couldn't make out much of what he said other than that he would chop them up and a few other threats. They both made it safely out of the woods and they didn't see him anywhere. They got in fear car and sped back to the town they were staying in. They called the police to file a report and headed to another area and will be heading home soon. I'm scared and pissed off that some creep did this to them. I served my country, Great Britain, for 12 years all over the globe. I've seen my fair share of face, to face with some of the most evil people on earth, but nothing comes close to this. I was sent to Alberta, Canada to do some training back in 1993. On the first day, I and a friend decided to go for a walkabout to get to know the area. We bumped into a few Canadian soldiers. A few words were exchanged, and one shouted back, Don't let the monkeys keep you awake. They laughed. 
We just looked at each other and then carried on. While out on exercise, a few of the guys said they were woken up in their sleeping bags by being pulled along the ground. I heard this a few times over the weeks. Also, their kit rations and other bits going missing. Nothing came of it. Also, an incident of one soldier missing, who was found the next day miles away from his platoon. He said he couldn't remember why he got separated, but felt that he was followed during the night by some animal. Nothing more was said. We spent around 19 months out there. On one occasion, I was going out to check the lay of the land, and a group of Canadian soldiers were just coming in. It looked like they had been out for a few days, looking at the state of them. One of them asked me, you going out? I replied, I don't know, he said. Monkeys, watch your back. I replied, okay. I was thinking that I heard this before. I noticed the guys had their heads down. They looked pretty worn out. A few months on one of the guys said something about seeing three bears walking toward him on two feet on a trail while out walking. I immediately thought of walking on two feet. I went to find him. This was just a few hours after his encounter. I couldn't find him anywhere. The following day, I asked around as to where he was. He's gone, a guy said. What do you mean, gone? Gone back to his regiment. I knew straight away why. I later found the guy who told me about this. He just didn't want to talk about it, so I left it there. It was September. I remember this well because I lost two of my best friends and I was feeling very down and lost. It was a bad time in my career for me. I decided to go for a drive, a weekend break. I had an old pickup truck and just drove, not really going anywhere in particular. I stopped for a break in a beautiful area not far from Medicine Lodge, Alberta. I had been on the road for two days, sleeping in the back of the pickup. I had decided to go for a walk on a trail along a tree line. I walked about a hundred yards away from the tree line, and I see a coyote just stop on the trail. I had never seen one so close. Our eyes met, and we just stared at each other. I suddenly feel uncomfortable. The coyote keeps glancing back and forth from the tree line. I'm really feeling anxious, not because of the coyote, but what's in the tree line? The coyote moves backward and forward, then just disappears into the grass. I'm left staring at the trees. Something is telling me to come closer. I can't explain this, but my head's telling me no. I don't know how long I was there, but I'm so scared. I've never felt so much fear, to the point where I felt sick. I slowly walked backward, keeping my eyes on the tree line. I then turned and ran like a bad dream. I got in my pickup and never looked back. I still think about it to this day. What was in those trees? The months go by, and then my battalion comes over for an exercise. One night while out, I was with another mate. We were parked on a hill, overlooking a large bowl down below where a platoon of men were all sleeping. It was around 2.30 in the morning, clear skies. You could see a good distance without using any aids. My friend was asleep. I noticed a group of coyotes down below. It looks like they were looking for a free meal. I'm thinking, is this what happens when someone feels they're being dragged in their sleeping bags? Could a coyote have that much strength? I watched them for a while, getting bolder by the minute. Then suddenly their body language changed. Four of them ran in one direction while one was just standing there looking up the hill. I looked through my night vision. Then all of a sudden, three human-type figures just stood up one after the other, all of different sizes. The first thing that stood out to me on adjusting my sights is that I could clearly see that the largest one was a Bigfoot. No doubt about it. It was standing at nine feet tall, and the second one was around seven and a half feet tall. The other one was six feet in height. I looked at my mate, still snoring away, and just left him to it. The details on the tallest Bigfoot were easy to see. Wow, so big. I could see his eyes. They were all looking in my direction, then just turned and walked down into another valley. I could see the hair swaying on his arms, even the calf muscles. I'm just smiling to myself. To me, this was the last piece of the puzzle. I had recently told my daughter about this. She believes me. There are so many people that know about these creatures, especially where I was. It's common knowledge. I think about them every day. I'm glad I saw them, and I've always believed that they existed.
Some friends and I used to go exploring in the woods. We were all insomniacs and never slept, and we'd even walk around when it was night with flashlights, obviously. We'd wander around until we got tired and then turn around. Dumb, I know, but we were young and thought we were invincible, and we also grew up out there and knew the area really well. Well, one day we get really deep in. We've been hiking for over a few days, obviously have taken breaks to rest and eat. We'd been planning this, but we were in the part of the woods we'd never been before. No one really went in this part because there's a rumor it's haunted. There's no particular reason why it's haunted. People just say it is, and everyone stays away from it. So obviously that meant the five of us needed to check it out. We've been hiking for a few hours again, and we stumble upon this. Compound. I don't know what else to call it. It was a bunch of huge brick buildings. I mean, hundreds of them. They were all falling apart and caving in, overgrown with ivy, but there weren't any signs anywhere. We decided to check it out. Some of the buildings are pretty unsafe. The floors have caved in, but we're so fascinated wondering WWTF is this place until we start to notice something really weird about it. It's these huge buildings, but there are no bathrooms, no kitchens, no closets, just rooms. Just a ton of rooms in all the buildings. They all have chimneys, but there's no fireplace, except a huge incinerator room that leads into a smaller incinerator room that has like a fake door that leads into an even smaller room with some teeth. We start getting a little freaked out, but we figure it's probably just animal teeth or whatever, so we move on. We decide to go in one last building because it's closer to where we came from and is more in a clearing so we can make a safe getaway if we need one. Now while we're here, the whole time it's been eerily quiet. The buildings have all been really dirty, but we start to notice it's also really weird that there's nothing left behind in any of these rooms. No furniture, no clothes, no odds and ends, no beer bottles or chip bags from squatters or teenagers. There's also windows on the outside of the houses, but no windows inside, like the rooms are just walls. We climb into this house through a hole on the side of the wall because the door won't budge. It's small and some of us have to squeeze in. I go in first and I immediately feel just weird, like bad. I tell them to hold on, but they make it sound like I'm being silly, so we laugh it off and they all come in, but then we all feel... We notice this is the first staircase we've been able to find. All the other buildings have three stories, but there were no staircases anywhere. This staircase is right to the side as soon as walk in. We all kind of look at each other like we want someone to say we should leave, but none of us want to be a lie, bitch. So we decide to go up the stairs. My friend and I go first to check it out, and again, it's just a bunch of empty rooms. But my friend and I start getting really creeped out. Our other friends are exploring and find this creepy-ass book sitting on like this beam in the middle of one of the rooms. And then we notice a door to the side, which is weird because there haven't been any doors. So we decide to open it, and immediately, we want to scream, but we suppress it. We know we can't. There's blood everywhere. It's a bathroom, a small, tiny bathroom with a tub. There's blood in the tub and the walls and the mirror and marks where it looks like someone was dragged, but was trying to pull themselves away. We take some pictures before we get the F out uh, there and we turn around and our faces are just pale. Our friends ask us what's wrong and we say nothing. It's just a closet, but we know we need to leave immediately. We feel like we're being watched, so we don't say what we saw. We continue checking around and saying how cool stuff is. We don't want to let up. We saw anything. But then our friends start going down the hallway, even though it's so dark down there, that their flashlights won't even work. We look at each other knowingly, and we grab them and say, Hey, let's check out this room first to the side because we missed it. So we put them closer to the stairs and us closer to the hallway in order to try and get them away from whatever we feel like is down there. Our friends are clueless and peek into the other empty room while my friend and I hear something move, something definitely human. I can't describe it, but I know it wasn't an animal. It's like a shuffle across the floor and almost a whisper. Our flashlights all start to go out one by one, which we think is weird, 
But we're telling our friends is just probably because of the batteries. We tell our friends we gotta go check out that room we missed downstairs first before we come back up here and check out the cool hallway. My friends don't know what's going on, so they start going down the stairs. A marble rolls down the hallway. One. Single. Marble. We all freeze. We see a big hunting knife downstairs that wasn't there before. You can see part of the room downstairs from upstairs. By this time, my friend knows something is wrong. Something creaks. We shout, run. We run down the stairs. But we all have to fit through the tiny hole, but something is blocking it. We're freaking out. We hear laughing. My friend and I break the glass on the door and kick through the rotten wood, but it's still a smaller, just bigger hole. We send them through. Then my friend goes. I'm in the doorway. I look up. I see a sliver of two or three figures in different parts of the house. I see a blade in one of their hands. We all book it. I mean, we ran faster than I've ever run in my life. We didn't stop for hours. We just kept running and running and running. We told our friends not to stop. We said we have to keep going. Eventually, all of a sudden, we just felt this weight lift off our shoulders. It was like the woods even got lighter, more beautiful. We slowed down. We kept walking for a while until we were absolutely positive and we went through some riverbeds to throw off our tracks and set some fake ones. Our friends had no idea what was going on, so we finally tell them that someone was in that house or building or whatever and was about to straight up murder us or do something worse and that we had found someone's murder bathroom. We show them the pictures and they start freaking out and are upset. We didn't show them even though they admit they would scream, which would for sure given us away. We all were silent the rest of the way out because we were so scared. We finally make it out a while after as the sun is rising and we call the police, but they don't believe us. We were just teenagers at the time. We can't even tell them where it was because we stumbled upon it and we were so freaked out. A few days later, there's a fire in the woods. They find some remnants of structures and a few buildings are left standing, but not the one we were in and no evidence of someone living there, but everyone in town thought it was weird but in a cool way, except us, obviously. The police said if anyone was there, it was probably just a buck they were skinning and that's all. But I know it wasn't. My friends and I have never talked about it again. It's kind of like an unspoken rule, and we never go to those part of the woods, not even in that general direction. As a park ranger in Yellowstone National Park for many years, I never anticipated the terrifying encounter I had one fateful night. With darkness surrounding the vast wilderness, I embarked on my routine patrol, oblivious to the horrors that awaited me. The night was unusually quiet, a thick mist veiling the towering pines and casting eerie shadows on the forest floor. Venturing deeper into the park, my gaze caught an unmarked trail, beckoning me with intrigue and curiosity. Unable to resist its mysterious allure, I ventured into its uncharted depths. The path led me away from the familiar track, winding through dense vegetation and twisted trees. Silence hung heavily, broken only by the rustling of leaves beneath my boots. I couldn't shake the feeling of trespassing in an ancient realm, untouched by humanity. As I ventured further, a bone-chilling coldness settled around me, causing the hair on my neck to stand on end. The dense canopy blocked the moonlight, plunging me into an impenetrable darkness. It was then that I heard a low, guttural growl that reverberated through the stillness. My heart raced as I scanned the surroundings, searching for the source of the ominous sound. Amidst the shadowy undergrowth, I caught sight of a towering figure resembling Bigfoot, its massive frame blending with the darkness. Fear gripped me, threatening to immobilize my every move. Instinct surged within, urging me to escape the clutches of this cryptid creature. I attempted to retrace my steps, but the winding trail seemed to morph, guiding me deeper into its lair. The creature pursued me with a disturbing grace its elongated limbs propelling it effortlessly through the underbrush. Its hot breath grazed my neck, 
its thunderous footsteps closing in. Desperation flooded my veins as I desperately sought a means of defense. In a moment of clarity, I reached for my rifle, hands trembling with adrenaline. With unwavering determination, I aimed, fired, and unleashed a flurry of bullets at the advancing beast. It howled in pain, an otherworldly cry that reverberated through the night before vanishing into the depths of the woods. Gasping for breath, I collapsed to the ground, overwhelmed by the weight of the encounter. Sweat drenched my brow as I realized the magnitude of what I had witnessed. The memory of that cryptid creature lurking in the darkness would forever be etched in my mind. Yet as I sat there, shaken and alone, a nagging thought consumed me. Who would believe my account? Last year in northwest Florida, I was out hunting the swamp from a kayak. I had stayed out longer than I had wanted and went into the swamp further than I wanted. As darkness started creeping on me, I had a huge owl sweep down on me and almost hit me. It was absolutely silent. I never heard it until it had almost made contact with me. That started the puckering of the anus. After I somewhat calmed down from that, I noticed that a deafening silence had come over the swamp, completely unusual. Then it started. As I was paddling, I noticed a sound off in the distance. It was a faint sound of drums and people singing. Now where I was, it was many miles in a swamp with one way in and many miles to any other access to solid land. As I sat and listened, it became obvious to me that I was hearing music and chanting of Native Americans. I sat listening for quite some time. It was the only sound in the entire swamp. Then as quickly as I had noticed it, it had stopped. I paddled on in without any other sounds for the rest of the trip. Some years back, I was out deer hunting in southern Illinois. As usual, I was up and in the field by 3.30 a.m. I had scoped out my spot the day before and taped off some trees with fluorescent tape to help guide me through the dark well that plan didn't work for shit. So here I am walking around this forest in pitch blackness. I thought for sure I knew where I was going, but I got myself all turned around. I was in my teens at the time, so I slightly began to panic. Thankfully, my pops taught me that if you ever find yourself lost in the darkness of the woods, just pop a squat and stay there until dawn. When dawn broke, I was able to see my deer blind was only ten or so yards from where I was at. It's not necessarily creepy, but that feeling of being totally lost in unfamiliar woods is extremely nerve-wracking. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.